you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, fascinating conference. <coughs> Um, so what I will be talking about today then is to, well I'll be examining the rituals that we can uh, imagine being enacted at two assembly sites and I've got the two uh, sites of Arnundshög and Gamla Uppsala in Sweden and these sites are located about 80 kilometers away from each other. So I'm going to be speaking about the relationship between these two sites. So in my previous research, I have shown that assembly sites were located in carefully selected places and that the sites were designed with certain features and that the sites were then constantly rebuilt and remodeled by the elite to communicate uh, their power to the population. Uh, and this view is reinforced then by recent archaeological investigations at the two sites of Arnensberg and Gamla Uppsala. So in this paper, I will be bringing together archaeological evidence and written sources, and together the, the, the sources cover a time period spanning more than a thousand years, from uh, the Roman Iron Age to the late medieval era. Uh, and the reason I'm taking this wide approach is partly due to the different types of evidence used, but it also connects then to the recent research showing that many Scandinavian assembly sites were extremely long-lived and were the focus of gatherings in various forms from the Late Bronze Age uh, or the Early Iron Age until the Late Middle Ages. Uh, and this is indeed the case with both Arnensberg and Gamla Uppsala. So it's not my intention to try and explain and interpret the Iron Age archaeology, and this is Scandinavian uh, Iron Age archaeology in that time period, but I don't want to explain this through written sources, but rather uh, say that the written sources can point us to practices that uh, in some form have been present for a very long time, although with ever varying content and meaning, and I really want to stress that last point. Um, so uh, the majority of rituals that I will be discussing today then were uh, elite driven, uh, but are also examples of rituals that may have been created and directed by the lower uh, of the community, but I'm not going to go into that part today. So for the elite, the overriding uh, aim of assembly rituals was presumably to create a communal identity and a collective memory um, uh, among the people gathered, uh, and these rituals can therefore be defined as commemorative practices. An important part of the arguments that I will be presenting today is that memory is not restricted to the mind, but rather a bodily experience created through a range of sensory perceptions, such as visuals, smells and tastes. And this taps into the very nature of commemorative rituals. Uh, they entail performances, such as evocation and declarations of key components of ritual narratives, but also bodily movements, such as gestures, postures, and motion. And in addition, dramatic spectacle, spectacle tends to be employed to strengthen memory creation. So a key component of this type of ritual is moreover that they are performative, that they're very, that means that their very performance accomplishes a change in the world. And rituals enacted as part of commemorative practices were designed to produce the continuation of tradition, uh, but since they were played out intermittently, their content also subtly changes through performance. They tend to be formulated in advance. They follow a pattern devised by the ruling elite. So this means that rulers could, through the use of carefully planned and executed rituals, um, transmit uh, ever-changing messages to the audience and indeed different messages to different groups uh, in the audience. And um, so I'm just going to start by giving an overview of the two sites that I will be discussing today. And my main focus today is the site of, of Onantur, because this is a site that um, I have excavated to get, together with um, Sarah Semple and we co collaborated on the assembly project. But uh, this site uh, of Arnens Herb then uh, is documented as a thing site, uh, an assembly site between the 14th and the 16th century. So again, they're typical, very late. Um, but the evidence then suggests that this site was in use for assemblies and gatherings of various uh, forms uh, in the Viking period and, and much earlier in the Iron Age too. So this site is a palimpsest of monuments with burials uh, originating in the migration period. 
uh, including a very large burial mound, uh, undated so far, uh, and five ship settings. There are uh, numerous hearths and cooking pits in this area. As soon as you um, just open up the ground, this burnt material um, comes, uh, comes up straight away. So it's absolutely filled with those types of features. Uh, most of these features that have been dated uh, range between uh, circa uh, 150 and 540 AD. And um, they span uh, a huge area. Uh, if you're looking at this area photograph here, we've see if I can find this. Oh, oh yeah, I can see it on the screen. But so we've got the large mound here, and this is presumably the, the uh, area of the assembly site and the burials. But um, we can probably make out this area here as well. And all these uh, areas are more than one kilometre uh, in size that seems to be covered with this type of, of debris. Um, at the site is also a large rune stone um, with the inscription, Folk Reader raised all of these stones in memory of his son, Hirin Ernander's brother. So the text is believed to refer to this long row of standing stones. You can see just uh, behind the rune stone, um, and it's, the rune stone is dated to the first half of the 11th century. Um, and But there are lots of other standing stones on the site as well, so it's possible that those also could be referred to by this inscription. But it's very clear that a lot of activity was going on here uh, in the middle of the 11th century. Um, so in the immediate vicinity of um, this site, um, it's located just next to a prominent esker. There are large numbers of Iron Age burials, often placed uh, in layers on top of each other. Some of these were clearly of elite status. Uh, there's an unusually rich furnished weapon burial here, dating from the second half of the 6th century. And recent field work then that um, Sarah and I carried out the site, we carried out an extensive geophysical survey, and we found the remains of a very large wooden uh, monument. And so again, if you can just make out this uh, faint row that uh, stretches across the site. Uh, and then when we excavated, uh, it turned out to be remains of a, an extremely large uh, monument, wooden posts that were erected and went straight across the site. I'm going to just go onto it. So this one goes like that. Um, so we couldn't date um, the actual monument, but we have a C14 dates of an associate, associated feature, and that demonstrates that the monument was constructed after the end of the Roman Iron Age or after the end of the migration period. Um, so then we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. I'm just going to talk about Gamla Uppsala. So Gamla Uppsala is referred to uh, most famously by Adam of Bremen in the 11th century and Snorri Sturluson uh, in the 13th century. And they talk about this as the assembly of all Swedes, that is the supreme assembly in the early Swedish kingdom, where also a large sacrificial feast was held. So despite uh, these two sources having been seen as rather biased, both Adam and Snorri are in remarkable agreement with each other, and um, these people have studied the sources in great detail, so they say that there's little reason to doubt that Gamla Uppsala was the site of an assembly and also sacrificial gatherings. So this too is a multi-period site, um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, from John tomorrow. Um, but um, spanning a sizable area, a huge number of burials dated from the early Iron Age through to the Viking period. It has two very large uh, Vendel period hall buildings with some outstanding material culture, metal production, etc. Um, and we've got these three uh, huge burial mounds known as the Royal Mounds, particularly prominent, and they're quite similar in size to the mound at Arnonshoeg. Uh, so these mounds were initially constructed around burials and were gradually extended over time, um, a process that lasted between 550 and 700 AD, and this is the work of, of John Junkrist. So um, recent excavations at this site then have revealed um, two monuments, rather similar to the one that we have at Arnhem's Hug. We excavated ours in 2008, uh, and you've probably seen these pictures that were spread all over the world uh, in the last few years. Um, so uh, it consists of two different parts. So this is the northern stretch of the monument. Uh, so you can see um, the, the post big again, remains of big, big wooden posts, uh, and they've all been excavated. And this, this is the northern stretch of the monument leading into the site 
and the Gamlap Salas Light is just behind. You can see the red wooden barn and the trees in the background, and that's um, where the actual site is located. And um, the post excavation work is still ongoing, so the dating is not entirely clear, but at least for the. Um, we can see, oh yeah, so we can see um, they, they, we've also got a, a second part of the monument, which I've stretched it's sketched out on this map here. Um, and let's see if I can. It's difficult to find this arrow. I'll just point again. So we've got another the big enclosure that just now comes down like that into the site, and then we've got a second enclosure like that. I call them enclosure. Other people might want to interpret them differently. And. Um, so we've got these two sites with very similar monuments, and, and those monuments are likely to be relatively contemporary. So the question is then, what was their purpose and, and what was going on at this time? So the first point to make is that these monuments are so far unique to this part of Sweden, uh, and the investment in terms of planning, logistics, resources, as well as manual labor would have been colossal. And these achievements must have been carried out by a well-organized group of people under strong leadership. And to my mind, we can see a scenario of intense competition between two neighboring elites here, bearing in mind that assembly sites tend to have specific landscape characteristics and archaeological features, uh, which can be seen as, as signposts to these sites of power. So the inspiration and borrowing between different sites is particularly evident uh, in the provinces of Uppland and Sörmland in Sweden. Uh, we, we have several examples where powerful families seem to have been competed over the control of an assembly site um, and in effect claiming that their site was the one to use through a combination of inscriptions um, and appropriate features. We've got this example here, a uh, very famous site, uh, Arkel's Thing site. Um, which dates to the early 11th century, and it seems to have been superseded um, only about 50 years later by another thing site created by a powerful man named Yalabanki. <coughs> so the similarities between Anushoek and Gamla Uppsala suggest a process of ongoing uh, going rivalry where the bar was pushed higher and higher in terms of site <coughs> architecture. Other similarities uh, than the wooden monuments are clearly seen. Both sites are surrounded by large cemeteries, uh, and a few kilometers away, wealthy boat burials are also situated. Uh, the thing is that uh, Gamla Uppsala, everything at Gamla Uppsala is slightly bigger than Arnenshoek. So they have sort of smaller cousin looking up to Gamla Uppsala there. But this fits into this overall pattern in the first millennium AD, when we have these uh, number of elite central places emerging. We've got Apokra again, mentioned by Gordon, and Gudme as well, and they start emerging at this time. But these sites were driven by a change in power relations. Power seems to have been transformed from extended king groups to a monopoly uh, of rulership by leading persons or, or families. And the archaeological evidence suggests that ritual formed an important part of political power and that a degree of competition in terms of ritual um, performance uh, we can, can, can also be suggested. Um, so uh, it can be envisaged that the wooden monuments were constructed by itinerant rulers with the intention of creating a collective memory of the rulership and law and in extension a collective identity for the people using the space. <laughs> Um, and in this way, uh, they could inscribe, the rulers could inscribe their presence into the landscape and also make their imprint uh, on the population during their periods of abs absence. Uh, but these aims, of course, cannot have been created by monument creation alone. But I do think that the building process, just as Gordon suggested, could have you know, been an important part of this. Uh, but material culture gains its meaning through the physical presence of, uh, or experience of usage. So to generate meaning and also remembrance, therefore, the monuments need to be incorporated into routinized practices. So for everyday, everyday objects, this may involve rather mundane tasks. Um, for monuments, on the other hand, rituals and spectacle tend to be employed to physically impress collective memory onto the people present. So therefore, as I suggested earlier, for the monuments at Gamla Uppsala and Anushoek, to fulfill that purpose, commemorative practices were most likely performed. 
it would have been desirable for Iron Age rulers to confirm their place as legitimate heirs approved by the ancestors. So through the various monuments at Donnenshoek and Gamluppsala, these rulers could create a place for the family in the genealogy of the landscape. Using the same concept, uh, the monuments may have been intended to forget previous rulers by overwriting the history in the landscape. And in this way, monuments may have served as commemorabilia, uh, that is, they indexed past events, people and objects, and therefore offering a direct access um, to the past. But at the same time, the commemorabilia could promote cultural transmission and link to the future by providing information uh, on the rules. Um, so the e effectiveness of a ritual is judged on how well it's remembered. So bearing in mind that memory is a bodily experience to ensure maximum effect and memory creation, a successful ritual tends to involve dramatic performances and essentially spectacular objects. So if we look about going back to this um, image again, we can um, see that uh, this big wooden monument. And of course, now we are seeing multiple periods uh, on this image. So because uh, so many features are undated, we've just added this wooden monument onto this. But it's very likely that there would have been fewer features when the modern wooden monument um, uh, was erected. Um, but it's still very prominent uh, in its size and display. And judging from the depth of the foundation pits and the hefty stone linings, the posts may have been as tall as eight or 10 meters. And uh, you can see some examples there. So they look like absolutely ginormous post holes. Um, so moving on um, slightly in time and slightly different sources, I'm going to be thinking about sacrifices and executions. Um, because these um, two um, activities um, seem to have been part of assembly rituals in varying degrees, uh, and they belong to the most dramatic forms of spectacle. At Gamluppsala, there is archaeological evidence of sacrifices. Deposits of burnt and unburnt burnt from horse, pig and cattle have been recovered from the post holes, as well as a complete skeleton of a young dog. And there are presence of horse and dog skulls in particular, then, is adds to the ritual nature of the remains. And it's... Um, it's possible that uh, bodies were suspended, perhaps, uh, on cross beams on, on this massive monument. don't know whether it existed, but the excavators have suggested that that's a possibility. But the written sources suggest that sacrifices and or executions may have taken place in the later period as well. So Adam Bremen, he stated that large sacrifice lasting eight days was held once every eight years. Each day, one human uh, and several animals were sacrificed, giving a total of 72. Uh, similar descriptions of sacrificial gatherings on an eight-year cycle are found in other sources, such as the Chronicle of Tietmark of Merseburg, and Adam's description on the whole therefore seems plausible. Again, this is the, the conclusion of the people who, are, who have studied these sources in, in detail. So the dramatic spectacle is particularly valuable for the creation of long-term memories with little read for re need for reiteration which could explain the long um, intervals between these large sacrificial gatherings. So it's possible that the human sacrifices described by Adam were instead uh, people who were executed. It is possible that these people were actually executed uh, rather than being human sacrifices. Um, and the reason I'm suggesting this is that this, uh, the practice of execution is occasionally mentioned in sagas, and they are then described as royal actions at top levels assemblies only, and this is an idea supported by geographical study of execution sites and thing sites, showing that the two only coincide at top level sites. <laughs> Public executions and display of the rotting corpses would presumably have been, very, been a very effective way for the rulers to show the power of their law. Animal sacrifices and executions may well have taken place on and so too, but there is no direct evidence of this. But bearing in mind that violence and murder were taboo within the assembly space, uh, the effects of executions um, ordered by the ruler must have been even more powerful. So moving on to uh, ritual language and performative speech. Um, also, these activities seem to have been uh, employed uh, for additional spectacle. So in medieval Iceland, the law was recited or possibly sung at the assembly over a three-year period, and the alliteration, rhythm, and rhyme were most likely employed in the transmission of such oral traditions across Scandinavia. 
um, thus adding to the ritual nature of the meetings. In addition, legal proceedings may at least uh, partly have been carried out in verse. Uh, the known runic inscriptions by assembly sites are written in poetic meter, uh, and in early medieval Ireland, to use a parallel here, there was an overlap between the roles of poet and law speaker. And this, of course, also links in the, uh, to the wealth of legal references found in uh, Norse Eddic poetry. The ritual nature of thing proceedings in terms of language use has also been highlighted by Sverre Bagge. He has stated uh, through detailed um, studies of the saga um, that the slightest deviation in words or phrases at the assembly would result in a case being thrown out. So these aspects may then added to the ritual experience, but would at the same time have acted as a boundary, limiting access to those who were able to perform in the correct manner. Um, so, um, this is a map of Onan's Hög. Um, you, it's, a, it's a dating from um, 1689, and I've added the, our excavated and some natural features to the map. So, uh, it seems that um, the wooden monument at Onan's Hög, um, and it, I think it's the same for, for Gamla Uppsala as well, but I illustrated um, it through this site, that um, the wooden monuments can serve uh, the dual purpose of a press processional route and an enclosure. And um, so here we see at Anna's Hög, both functions seem to have been served by this single post uh, or row of posts. So this is the excavated remains of the monument. And these are um, roads leading into the site. Um, so we also, but then um, the wooden monument then enclosed the one open side of the site. So the remaining uh, sides of the site seem to have been enclosed by the watercourse that's winding its way through the site. And then we've got the, the grey area to the left here, which is a, a very large area of wetland. So in that sense, the site was enclosed by a combination of water and a wooden monument. And this enclosed area uh, may most likely represented a sacred space to which only the very top of the elite had access. So by the time of written, the written sources, at least, um, we have references to um, thing piece applying uh, within the space and a variety of other special regulations also apply. So all in all, um, the enclosed areas uh, at Area at Arnhem's Hög uh, and other assembly sites probably uh, can be um, described as symbolic islands. Mm -hmm. And this idea is reflected in the archaeology of many thing sites uh, across the Norse world as water in some form is frequently occurring as a boundary feature. The importance of water also clearly comes across in the written sources uh, from the early Eddic poetry to the provincial laws. So in this context, uh, it's also relevant to point out to you that the wooden monuments at Anunsherg and Gamla Uppsala both start at watercourses. So an implication of the existence of enclosed sacred space is that entry to the site was restricted and ritualized. And we can imagine the wooden monument serving as some kind of monumental choreography. Uh, the archaeology suggests motion, as, for example, ritual processions along the rows of tall posts towards a particular point of entrance into the sacred space. Motion and ritualized entry to the assembly is also implied in Eddic poetry. We've got stanza 89 of Grimnis Maul, which reads, Come then, Umt, and the two Kerologer, these Thor must wade each day when he goes to sit as judge at the ash of Yggdrasil, for the bridge of the Aesir burns all with flames, the sacred waters boil. Um, and so this uh, points point out these features and also emphasizes that this, the water as a boundary feature. But there is further support in the written sources that uh, journeys and movies uh, or movement uh, were intrinsically linked to the thing. So the next stanza of Grimlin's Mal reads, when the Aesir ride to sit as judges. And three stanzas of the Eddic poem Völuspál use the phrase, then all the powers went to the thrones of fate. So they're always moving to go to the assembly. Again, the Old Norse word eith, um, for oath, um, has been traced back to the um, Indo-European word oitha, to walk, going, with the implicit meaning of ceremonially going to an oath, swearing. So again, this is strikingly similar to the expression in Eddic poetry. 
And also in the Icelandic law, Gragaus, there's a rich procession setting out the boundaries of the site created, and this created the Thing Helger, the holy area of the Thing. And the procession was thus performative and essential for the meetings to take place. So the sites uh, at Ernas uh, Hög and also Gamla Uppsala, they have these theatrical characteristics with an open area serving as a stage and perhaps the surrounding mounds uh, as platforms for spectators. So taking into consideration the integrated role of mythology and law at this time and the suggestions performance of mythical plays as part of funerals, it could be envisaged that the rituals at the two sites involved enacting poems, such as Grimnismal, with the rulers and close allies entering into the sacred space. Indeed, Terry Gunnell has stressed the dramatic character of the Eddic poems and suggested that they were intended to be performed and that they can be seen as elementary plays. Um, just as uh, the Icelandic assembly procession, such rituals may have been performative. Um, Although there are no definite evidence of ritual activities that were played, at, played out at thing sites, we can perhaps, I'm nearly at the end, um, imagine um, the warriors perhaps embedding the poem, wearing elaborate helmets, clothing and jewellery, and glimmering, uh, and this, this glimmering in the light of the fires, and wading and riding into the sacred space. And such events and performative acts may have been derived from mythology. Alternatively, of course, as mythology is something that's always evolving, they may, may represent mythology and poetry in the making, drawing on existing beliefs and traditions. So my conclusion, which is short, um, the assembly rituals uh, that I have been examining today, uh, they can all be seen as performative and to lead to the production of sacred space. Memory as a bodily phenomenon um, transmitted through sensory experiences uh, demonstrates that the diffusion of law, uh, mythology and tradition should not be seen purely as a result of oral trans transmission, but that such oral accounts were probably illustrated and enhanced through a complex web of ritual and spectacle, which supported and strengthened memory production. The rituals uh, offered uh, people um, a combined sense of participation and exclusivity. And I think about the wider um, population here. They could perhaps walk along the rows of posts from the water courses to the site, but perhaps could not enter into the sacred enclosure. But watching the elaborate rituals and experiencing them with all their senses and perhaps participating in other communal rituals uh, would most likely have created memories that would have lasted uh, for them for many years to come. Thank you.